So today we're going to talk a little bit about Philippians chapter 4, which actually has a lot of different thoughts in it. Uh, Paul loved the Philippian church, and so he's dealing with people that he loves and cares about, his friends, and he is now going to give them just some practical advice. So I hope today I'll be giving you some practical advice on friendships. If you're married, this might help you in your marriage relationship. If you have a job where maybe your boss is not always easy to get along with, this might help you. Anybody who works over here down the street at the bus place, you'll know. Um, we got a couple of guys that work down the street, so I'm harassing. Their boss is here too, so I'm harassing them. Which is just an inside joke for you. So let me ask you a question. Do you have folding chair friends? You need some friends that you've sat around a fire with, not during the summer, because then they hate you. You need some friends that you have maybe sat on the porch with or gone camping with or had a Bible study with and maybe sat out by the pool or, or just took some time to sit with. Years ago, when I first moved to Titusville, we got a house up there. Kyle was just a little skeeter, uh, and he just turned 32, so this is an old story. But we had some neighbors who every night would pull out folding chairs. And all of the neighbors would come down the street and would sit in those chairs as dust came and it cooled off. And, and we would solve all the problems of the universe together, you know, and, and become friends. And I will say that I still, on occasion, see some of those neighbors uh, in the grocery store or somewhere else. And they still come up to me like we're old friends. If you have not taken time to go out of your way to establish deep friendships, I just want to encourage you to do that. And today I'm going to give you just hopefully some, some practical advice from Philippians to do that. By the way, we've talked about just some great passages in Philipp Philippians. If you haven't had a chance to read the book of Philippians, it's a great time. It maybe take you a half hour. Um, you can even have it read to you. That's the thing. Nowadays, you just push play and then you go to sleep and you wake Marcus up at the end of church and... All that stuff. So today we're going to talk about can we live like Jesus and treat others like Christ. And we're going to talk first about can we release and rejoice in agreement. Have you ever had friends who were fighting over something that didn't matter? Have you ever had friends that you thought, well, why would you fight over that? Uh, you know, over the years, the pastor, I've seen all kinds of fights over all kind of things. My favorite is when people fight over sports and they really get mad at each other. And David knows that even though I have uh, gone from being a Dolphin fan to now a Tampa fan, and, and the Tampa Bay Bucks have begged me not to be a fan of theirs because <laughs> all the years I was a Dolphin fan, they did not win anything. And so I moved to Tampa. So we'll see what happens. The Dolphins will probably take off. But no matter what David does, he's been an Indianapolis fan, and they've won one game. <laughs> so there's always worse days. But the truth is, one of the reasons we love sports is because we realize when we watch sports, as much as they pretend it matters, I can tell you right now, the guys on those shows know that what they're talking about doesn't matter. And one of the nice things about sports is to recognize it doesn't matter. Well, Paul at the very beginning of chapter 4, is dealing with a couple ladies who are having an argument, which most theologians believe is like an argument over nothing. Maybe it's over where they meet, or maybe it's over where they have church, or maybe they don't like the flavor of the coffee. I don't know what it's about, and, and, and so here we go. I plead with Eudea, and I plead with Syncte, which, which some people, by the way, think this is Lydia, another name for Lydia. We don't really know, but could be. Uh, to be the same mind in the Lord. And this idea of same mind is the idea of like a guitar. If you play a guitar and one string's out of tune, it's different. And it's also weird if all the guitar strings were actually tuned exactly the same. So if, if a choir sang the same notes, it's called the monotone tabernacle choir, right? Yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, right? Boring, and we call that a cult, by the way, okay? And so this is the idea of having the same mind, but you don't have to believe exactly the same thing. You just have to be in harmony with one another. You have to be able to get along even when you disagree. And so that's what Paul's saying here. And then he says, yes, I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose name are in the book of life. And I love this. Paul says, basically, help them to get along and think about eternity. You know, everything seems like a big deal until something happens. 
And, and the truth is, if you're driving your car, right, and you maybe have a road rage issue, suddenly when you look down and you realize your gas light's on, it's amazing how much calmer you become, isn't it? Suddenly everything changes because suddenly you realize, you know what, I'm going to run out of gas and it's 100,000 degrees out here and I'm going to die. It's amazing how slow you can drive at those points. Just, just going to go slow. You might even turn off your air. Have you ever had a so close to out of gas that you turned off the AC? If you're a Floridian and that's happened, that's desperation. And so Paul's looking at this early church and he's saying, you think all this is a big deal, but you need to realize the big deal is that you are going to go to heaven. And that's the big deal. That's why you can get along even when you disagree about little things. You can agree about the big stuff. So if you have a friend who has a little different theological position, if you have a friend who has a little different way of thinking about something, whether it's about creation or dinosaurs, or so this morning somebody asked me about the Nephilim. Nephilim I never say that word right, but you know what I'm talking about, the giant people. And, and I'm like, I, I don't know, maybe. And people like certainty, so they'd rather you just say yes or no. And I'm like, maybe. And they get mad at me for that, which is awesome. And so what, what's the big deal? It's about heaven. That's the big deal. And then he continues. Rejoice in the Lord occasionally. When you feel like it. No, rejoice in the Lord always. This is Paul writing from jail to a church that's not in jail. It, it would be like me writing you from the hospital and go cheer up. You'd be like, dude, you're the one that should be depressed. And so Paul, chained to a Roman soldier, is writing, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he says, I'll say it again, rejoice, which we don't think much about it, but you've got to realize he had to go find paper. He had to find ink. He had to find a feather or whatever they wrote with back then. And then he had to, maybe, maybe he was using somebody and he was telling them and they said, are you sure you want to write that again? Yeah, yeah, I'll say it again. Rejoice, write that down. And so it's important enough that he says, hey, rejoice, rejoice. And then he continues, let your gentleness be evident to all. Can people say that about you? Would they consider you gentle? God forbid you've ridden with me in the car. Would they consider you gentle with others? And then it continues. The Lord is near. And I love that. It's like, hey, be gentle to people. Why? Because God's paying attention. You ever talking bad about your boss and they walk in? That's fun. Can you believe he will? Oh, hey. And there's movie after movie when they say, you know, he's right behind me, isn't he? And so sometimes we need to recognize that Jesus is with us, and that means he's paying attention to how we behave, what we're saying. Hey, and here's the hard part, even what we're thinking about the car in front of us. Left lane, 60 miles an hour, I-95, what are you, crazy? Do not be anxious about most things. No, do not be anxious about anything. And by the way, this means stop being anxious, which is Paul from jail writing to the early church and saying, would you guys quit worrying? And then he continues, but in every situation, what do you do with it? By prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. By the way, that's a great pattern. If you're struggling with anxiety, work on this sentence. Present your request to God and what will happen? The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So he starts out by saying, you guys are not getting along. And then he starts talking about anxiety, and we think that's two different thoughts. But here's what I'll tell you about anxiety. When you are anxious, it is very hard to get along with other people. Because when you're struggling with some type of anxiety or worry about something, you typically are not thinking of the people around you. You're thinking of how something is going to impact you or your situation. And so Paul says, lay that anxiety at his feet, lift it up in praise and thanksgiving. What will happen? You'll walk in peace. You ever been around somebody who's stressed out all the time? You ever been around somebody who doesn't know the difference between a big problem and a small problem and everything's a big problem? It's exhausting. 
Because they're walking all the time in anxiety and they're rubbing off on you. And the truth is, as a friend, if you're always walking in anxiety and if you always are walking in competition with other people, you're not going to be able to love the people around you. Do you think that you're in competition with everyone at work? And of course you'd say no. And then I'd say, okay, so when they get a raise, you think it's great? Well, no, I should have got that raise. So you are in competition with them. And the truth is, too often, without even meaning to, we think we're in competition with other people, and it makes us stressed out and freaked out. And if we recognize, you know what, God, you have every day, every moment in your hands. I can go to work and do what you've called me to do, and what God does in their garden is up to him. Sometimes that happens because we don't have good boundaries. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. In 1 John 4, 18 and 19, it says, There's no fear in love. Why? Perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And then he says, we love because he first loved us. Let me tell you one of the reasons that we don't love people well. It's because we don't recognize that God loves us. And we sometimes worry that if God loves that person, how can he love us? Because we don't have good boundaries. Let me tell you how boundaries work. If you're in a house with a fence, and you look over your fence, and your neighbor is cutting down their orange tree, your reaction is going to be, wow, something must have happened to their orange tree. They're cutting down their orange tree. If you're a normal person. However, if you have an orange tree, and you see the neighbor climbing over the fence with a saw, and they start cutting down your orange tree, your response properly should be very different. Hey, that's not your orange tree. Get out of my yard. And here's the deal about our emotions, about our personal life, about our belief systems. You have to know what is you and what is someone else. And so if someone else says, I don't believe in God, that should not make you feel threatened about your beliefs. When somebody online, I'm going to tell you this again because I've seen it so often. When somebody online doesn't agree with you and you get an online Kermit the Frog (laughs) argument with them. And you finally can't take it anymore and you say, good luck in hell. Which I have seen a hundred times. Do you know why people do that? Because they see you cutting down your orange tree and they think, how dare you cut down that orange tree? You're messing with my orange. No, no, that's not in your yard. We have to understand that people get to make their choices. People get to be who, even wrong choices, especially if you have children, this is really hard. But part of life is knowing these are my boundaries. This is my orange tree. And I get to decide whether I give you an orange or not. And you don't get to jump the fence and just grab oranges off the tree. But I also can't jump in your yard and cut down that orange tree, right? And so that's the idea of boundaries. And so when we say this idea of there's no fear in love, what happens is we're afraid because we don't know where we end and where someone else begins. If you're going to be friends with other people, You have to recognize what you're responsible for and what they're responsible for. Otherwise, you will suffocate them because you will hold on so tight that they will never be able to be themselves. And you have to, as the old song says, hold on loosely. Don't let go. Number two, refocus to renew your relationships. You ever offend somebody with a spoon? One of my favorite comedians is Tom Papa. And when Tom Papa's girls were teenagers, he said, they want me to die. And he said, I got to explain that to you. The other morning I was eating breakfast. I had a spoon. I was eating Raisin Bran. I look up and both my teenage daughters are just staring and glaring at me. And I said, what? And they said, do you have to chew that way? He said, do you not want me to chew? They said, that would be preferable. 
You want me to choke on my cereal? Sure. <laughs> the truth is, for any of us, if you focus on somebody's negative trait, on their brokenness, on the thing that they don't get right. And by the way, if you hang around anybody long enough, guess what? <laughs> And so, so we have to look at life and say, am I going to be the person who focuses on everything somebody does wrong? Or am I going to say, God, would you help me to deal with that the right way? Listen to what it says here. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, as Bill and Ted say, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen me put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Why will the God of peace be with you? Because you're not focused on the wrong things. So many times when we're making decisions, if we're focusing on the fear, we're going to handle it the wrong way. But if we recognize the power of God and say, God, I surrender this area to you. God, I present this relationship with you, to you. I present this problem to you. I, I know that you're taking care of it. Then you can love the people around you. You don't focus on everything that's wrong all the time. By the way, have you ever gotten in that mood where you're just like in a bad mood and you focus everything is wrong, everything is bad? That's why thanksgiving and praise is so important. Then he says this, I rejoice greatly, the Lord. You renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need. You know, I'm only in jail. For I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstances. I know what it's like to be in need. I know what it's like to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. You know what he's saying? You can be miserable and have everything. And you can be content and be in jail with nothing. And so he's looking at this church, which is in a fairly wealthy community, and he's saying to them, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstance. Hint, hint. Because you can have more than the rest of the world and still be discontent. Because contentment has nothing to do with your bank balance. Contentment has nothing to do with the amount of stuff that you have. They actually did a survey recently of Christians, and most Christians think God wants them to be wealthy financially. Because it's in the Bible? Nah. And so contentment has nothing to do with the amount. You can be, have tons of stuff and be discontent and be lonely and be sad. And then it continues. I've learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. And then he says this, I can do this through him who gives me strength. And that verse also sometimes is translated, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And we translate that all kind of ways, but you know what he's talking about? Being content. God, you can make me content in this situation, with this circumstance, with this problem with this difficulty, with this struggle, with this hang-up, with this hurt, with this pain, with this frustration. Why? Because he's with you. Chuck Smith talked a little bit about a few of these. When you're sick, Jesus is with you. When your heart is broken, Jesus is with you. When family and friends forsake you, Jesus is with you. When you're broke, Jesus is with you. When you don't know which way to go, Jesus is with you. When the enemy attacks you, Jesus is with you. And when you feel like you're alone, Jesus is with you. In Romans 12, 2, it talks about the way we think. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. How? By renewing your mind, which means thinking about life differently. We tend to be selfish and self-centered, and we think being selfish and self-centered is going to make us happy. We live in a world with selfish gravity, with even if we've been Christian for years, it's so easy to get pulled back to those old habits of thinking about ourselves and what we want and our interest all the time and thinking everything's about us. One of the biggest things I ever learned was I was worried about what other people were thinking and somebody said to me, you realize, Eric, they are not thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves. That's some of the best advice I've ever given to junior hires. Because they think everybody's looking at them. And I go, no, no, no. They're looking at themselves too. 
That's why you go out of your way to bless them. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I love what C.S. Lewis said. Friendship is born at the moment when one person says to another, you two, I thought I was the only one. It's one of the reasons I love the men's breakfast. Because one of the men will share something and one of the other guys is like, really? You do that same thing? I thought you were smarter than me, you know, or whatever. <laughs> Number, did I say that out loud? I meant to keep that part inside. Number three, relate and rely on God to provide. Listen, you want to get along with others? Find something you have in common. Listen, don't stop there. To do. If you're Christians, look for a goal together to serve together. And don't focus on each other's weaknesses. We all have weaknesses. You hang around me long enough, it'll take you about 30 minutes to make a list. If you need a list, you can call my brother. He'll give it to you. He's a pastor. Right? And so the truth is, we all have weaknesses, but as we work together, one of the reasons I love mission trips is I've gotten so close to people who go on our mission trips. We're going to have a mission trip the beginning of next month. Um, we're going to drive some folks up to Asheville, work in a children's home up there for a few days, help in their thrift store. I'll probably pull some weeds. Who knows what they'll have me do. Dug post holes last time. But whatever it is, we work together. And you know what happens when you work with other people? You're very different. But you learn that there's things that are bigger than your differences. So that's what Paul says here. He says, yet it was good of you to share my troubles. And then a few verses later, he says, I've received full payment and have more than enough. Basically, they shared with Paul financially so he could help other believers. He said, I'm amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent. They're a fragrant offering, acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And I love this. My God will meet all your needs. Don't misread that. It doesn't say once. Remember, Jesus prayed for daily bread, not weekly bread, monthly bread, retirement bread, right? He'll meet all your needs, what? According to the riches of glory of Christ Jesus. And then he says, to God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul, chained between two guards, saying to the early church, listen, don't focus on all these differences and the little things. Surrender that to God. Spend time in praise to Him. His peace will overtake you. And guess what? When you're full of peace, you make a lot better decisions than when you're full of anxiety. You treat people much better. So I told Kristen about this dream I had, and <laughs> she looked at me and said, You're not dying, are you? I'm like, uh, I hope not. That's not. But it does sound like a dream somebody would have before they die. The other night I had a dream that I was getting ready to go on a cruise ship. And there was a whole bunch of people gathered for the cruise ship. And as usual, I lost my phone. So I'm looking around for my phone. And as I'm looking around for my phone, I start walking past these different people. And all of a sudden there's people from high school that I knew. And I looked at them and I thought, wow, I'm so proud of them and what they've gone through. I've got friends from high school who've lost teenage children. Some who've gone through cancer. Some who've dealt with just unfathomable tragedies and God's using them and they're blessing other people and I saw some of them and then I saw some of my former students that I taught and I, I thought wow I'm so proud of you and here's what's really cool about that two of my former college students from almost 30 years ago got together last night and sent me a picture they didn't even know I was telling this story they last night they were together in Massachusetts the one lives in California the other was in Massachusetts the one flew had flown across the country and they got together and sent me a picture hey we just wanted you to know we're together and those were some of the people that I saw in my dream that I said I'm so proud of you guys you're doing such a great job and there were people from my family there there were other people that I never remember. One of my students who wasn't the best student, his name was Alan. I loved Alan. Alan's the one who handed me my phone in the dream. Here's your phone, Mr. B. Said, I found it. And here's what I realized about that dream. When you have friendships in life, there are people who've supported you and encouraged you and been there for you. But the key to that happening is for you. To be a friend to them. 
For you to release unforgiveness, for you to release that wrong focus, for you to recognize that you struggle with anxiety and sometimes you focus on the wrong things and say, God, would you help me to be the kind of friend that you would be to my friend? And I'm so blessed to know so many wonderful people over the year, including the years, including the people in this room. But none of that's possible when we focus on the wrong things. So Paul says, remember... Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You've you've got eternity. It's it's okay. Focus on what really matters. When the gas gauge is empty, it's amazing how much better you drive. And when you recognize that this life is not all there is, you do a lot better job of loving the people around you. And I just want to encourage you to do that today. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means that Jesus died and rose again because we're sinners, we're broken, we're messed up, and we need a Savior. And so Christianity is not just about knowing about Jesus. It's about saying, Jesus, I want to surrender all my sins, all my selfishness, all my ways of doing things to you and follow you the rest of my life, knowing that you died to take my sins. So if you want to talk about that after the service, I'd be glad to do that. Maybe you're here today and the truth is you're struggling with some of the things I talked about. That's okay. We all struggle. That's what confession's about. So make it right with God. Make it right with people. And just take the next step. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time together. I pray that you would bless each one. Lord, may we have the kind of friendships that only come from your grace. Lord, give us power through your spirit to love people better than we could love them on our own. Lord, I pray too that we would be a church full of of friendships, people that love each other, that know that each of us is broken, but we're able to see your grace, even in the middle of that. Lord, I thank you that you love us so much, you don't leave us where we're at, but you work on us day by day to become more like you. May we do that today, in Jesus' name, amen.